years ago, when I was a small boy, I loved flying kites. In fact, growing up, we used to make our own kites. We would uh, take some sticks out of the yard and uh, wrap the paper. Sometimes we use the uh, thick kind of glossy paper that we got on Sundays, and we'd wrap that over the sticks and glue it down and uh, put a string on it and connect a string to the, put a little hole. And we used to make our own kites. You may think, wow, how did you do that? Well, we didn't have smartphones then. It was a much nicer, simpler, more enjoyable time, frankly. Well, I remember also when they first came out with gala kites. Anybody remember what gala kites are? Okay, too bad. Gala Industries was founded in 1961, the year I was born, primarily as a manufacturer of plastic keel-guided delta wing kites that required no tails, as well as latex balloons. And the kites were sold worldwide in toy and hobby stores, and the company owners had several patents on their tailless keel-guided kite designs. There's a lot of things we just take for granted and think they've always been. Well, they didn't always been, haven't always been. I remember around 1973, they came out in even greater production, the baby bat kite. Maybe that'll bring a memory for some of you. They were expensive, at least for us. But you could get it out in the sky so far, you couldn't see it. If you had enough string, and we used to use fishing line, and you would tie it off, we'd hook it to a little fishing pole, and uh, you would tie the string off, and you could take and tie that off to something, and it would stay up and fly all night. You come out the next morning, it was still flying. You couldn't see it, but if you reeled it in, it'd still be flying. And we used to do that. Uh, you had to make sure there weren't any storms, and we didn't have the weather channel. Norma, there we go. All right. Okay. All right. She's averting her eyes, oh Lord. All right. But we used to uh, go over across the Missouri River to the Iowa side, uh, and a lot of flat areas right there from where the river had run. And uh, I remember one day with a friend of mine, won't mention his names in case he's listening because he might be, give you a hint, he lives in Texas, not far enough. But we were sending up, we used to call these the bad boys, one of these kites. And uh, we got this one kite up quite a ways. We could still see it out there. Uh, you had to use heavy line because the wind, as it got higher, really pulled on those kites. But as I started to reel it back in, I said, that's just about perfect right there. I can watch it. You can enjoy it. The breeze started to die down, and it started, Whoa. and uh, I said, okay, and it hit the ground so hard, we went over to see if it was blown apart. I wound up the string the rest of the way. We tried it again, and this time my friend said to me, I want to hold the string. You always hold the string or the pole. I said, okay, I'll let you try, but let me get up the sky again a ways first. So a good breeze came up. It stayed steady. I got the kite up about maybe 100 feet of line. And I turned it over to my friend. And I told him to hold the spindle, you know, in your right hand. And I said, hold the string with your left so it wouldn't spool out too fast. And I told him, don't let go of the pole for any reason at all. So I looked up, and suddenly the kite was going this way, and the pole was doing, 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 and down went the kite, nose dive. It had hit the hard ground really hard. My friend had let go of the pole. Stop, I said. Went up, caught the pole, picked it up, and I stopped again. We got it back up in the air. I said, he says, oh, come on, let me try it again. I won't let go this time. I said, okay, don't let go of the pole. Okay, you got to hold on to it. We're going to lose the pole or the kite or both. And that was a lot of money. Both were expensive to me back then. They still are. So I looked up at the kite and 
boy, he says, man, that thing is so cool. Look at that, you know, and it just kind of, uh, no tail, just, you hear it once in a while, fluttering. So what do you think he did? He let go again, all right? And the wind caught the kite, and it was gone. And it just took the pole, and who knows? So we lost the kite of the pole. I have to confess, I raised my voice and had a few choice words to say to him because not only did I lose my expensive kite and all the string, but I lost the pole. And I wasn't happy with him. But I quickly realized I should have expected what was going to happen. And I just need to forget about it. He must be mowing. That's what they do back home when you start when you start uh, speaking. The lawnmowers all have to come out, whatever building you're in. And so, what I thought about, and this is why I'm going to talk about some of this today. My good friend, oh, it's right there. My good friend had let me down. I'd ask him several times. You know, don't, please don't let go. But since he didn't have to pay, I guess, for the kite or the string or the pole, it wasn't that big a deal. And it admittedly was a pretty small thing in the grand scheme of things. But these kites were expensive and money was harder to come by for all of us. Now, I could have chosen to stay upset about it. You might think you sound like you still are. No, I'm not. Um, but I did sort of determine I was never going to fly kites with him again. At least not with my kite. It was his kite. It was different. But neither of those options seemed really smart or appropriate. So why do I share this ridiculous story about my friend not holding on to the kite? Well, this episode, this story, illustrates an inevitable fact of life. And I want you to listen to what I'm about to say. Nobody here will be able to relate to this. People are going to let you down. They're going to let you down. Not every person, not every time. You may think, I would never let anybody down, but I guarantee if you look hard enough in your life, you'll say, yep, I've let somebody down somewhere at some time in my life. Or you will. There are small letdowns, like ignoring instructions for flying a kite. And then there's big letdowns like committing sins with lifelong repercussions. So here's a question. What should we do when someone lets us down? Or should I say, what should we do? What should we do? Not what we do. What should we do when someone lets us down? Well, let me give you a short and easy answer, and then we're going to develop this further. Matthew chapter 6 Verse 14, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 14. I'm going to try to stay within the time allotment today, but I might not either. We'll see how it goes. Matthew 6, verse 14. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive your trespasses. And interesting, it isn't worded in the form of thou shalt, as Harry was you know, going through the Ten Commandments, but think of what happens if God doesn't forgive our sins. As Paul penned, that our faith would be futile, and we would still be in our sins, and the wages of sin is death. So you and I, all of us, must forgive others. I've mentioned this before, but I remember the time where a person that I was visiting uh, from the south, where we live, uh, it was in one of the parts of the south, we were talking about forgiveness. There was a situation, I said, well, you just need to forgive this person. And this person said, oh, I forgave them, but I will never forget. I said, you haven't forgiven Yes, I have. You can't judge me. I said, well, I can tell by your, what you're saying and your actions and your demeanor and your facial expression. You're still upset about it. You bet I'm upset. Well, okay. 
And so we must forgive others. The only alternative is what? Eternal death. And yep, that would be outside of God's kingdom. So that answers the what in a pretty simple answer. The more difficult question, though, this is what we're going to talk about today, is how. How? How do we forgive others? You may think, oh, it's easy. I forgive people constantly. I'm really good at it. Well, I would say you're probably not so good at it. You just think you're good at it. It's not so clear cut. I heard someone say once that forgiveness is not a science. It's an art. Now, if you don't know the difference between science and art, that's a whole different thing. He called it, and I've heard many people call it this, the art of grace or the, as I call it, the art of mercy and forgiveness. Now, that sounded pretty profound to me, so much that I want to study and do it more thoroughly. I did want to study. And I want to give a message on the subject. So today we're going to talk about, if you want a title, I know some of you love titles. Mercy and forgiveness is an art. I want to share another story with you. Um, and I have never told this story before. This is the first time, and I'm not sure I should tell it, but I'm going to tell it. Most of you know that with me, and I'm not my wife the same way, but serving at youth camps has always been a big part of our lives. Um, I'm often tempted to tell more time telling stories about things I did or lessons learned at camp because very profound ones. I want you to go back with me to back when dinosaurs ruled the earth and walked. The year was 1973 in Orr, Minnesota. The fellowship I was part of at that time had a youth camp called Summer Educational Program up in Minnesota. I was a camper then, unless you think I'm really older. I was a camper and I later served on the staff for many years. And I built many close friendships, many of which are still intact. And I remember this story pretty well. There's a young man, interestingly enough, I guess I'm in Texas, so he was, but he was from Texas, and he was from Houston, uh, which I'll be going to Monday. And he was in my dorm. And he kept picking on me and teasing me. Now. In 1973, I wasn't very old. I was also really skinny and not real strong, but kind of wiry. And this guy, uh, and I say this only so you get a better picture, he was tall. He was about that much taller than me. He was older quite a bit. He was athletic. He was African-American, so he was very just talented physically, just brilliant man young man, and he kept picking on me, and picking on me, and picking on me. And he wouldn't stop. And I got to where I really didn't like him very much. And one day as we left the steps going down from the dorm, he stopped at the bottom, and it was really great, because he stopped, and I was looking right in his eyes. We were level. So he was down a couple, three steps, and we were level. And he stood there, and he said, you can't pass, kitty. In other words, he blocked the exit to the steps, I, and I couldn't get around him, and he just stood there. And who knows what he was going to do, because he kept picking on me. I asked him nicely to move, and he wouldn't. I asked him again. He wouldn't budge, and he pushed me, and I kind of fell back and stood back up. He was a lot taller on the level ground, because I was now, though, right even with him. And so I did what all young boys and most adults do when they're confronted like that, I clenched up my fist, and as hard as I could, I punched him. And I hit him right in the face. And bam, down he went. I knocked him out. I haven't done that too many more times in my life. But he went down. It was like scared me, because it was like, wow. He just, I hit him just right. You know, those of you that box know if you hit somebody just right, they're going down. I don't care who they are. And he went down. And several people saw it, including the counselor and one of the staff members. I had just seriously broken one of the major rules of camp. <laughs> and I knew it. And I was immediately taken into the building and sat down. 
I'll never forget because I had three chairs of adults and here I was stand, uh, sitting and they were talking to me. And they had the other guy, uh, I don't mind telling his name because I'm sure he's not listening. Leslie was his name. And I remember they sat Leslie and me down and they were talking to both of us because we were both in trouble because they had watched him pick on me and he wouldn't let me pass and they saw me hit him. So they began to talk to us. And here's what's interesting. Neither one of us, because we both knew we were in trouble and we knew what could possibly happen, we didn't try to cover up or lie about the incident. And we both said yes. He said, I've been picking on him for the last several days and I was picking on him today and I wouldn't let him pass and he got mad and he punched me. And we both, neither one of us, tried to blame the other person or be called, declared a victim. We simply said, both of us, would you forgive us and we'll try to do better and just forgive us. We didn't expect that. We expected them to say, here, you know, we're calling the bus station, taking you down and you're going home. And, and the counselor and then the camp director who had come in, they didn't explain what went through their minds. They didn't even get together and confer to talk about it. They just both looked at the, they looked at the three of them, looked at each other, then they looked at us. You know what they did? They gave us another chance, both of us. They didn't kick us out. We were not sent home. They didn't even tell our parents. Now, my mom is not watching today. She will later, so mom. They didn't call and tell you. Then we were able to stay at camp and finish out the session, which was much longer back then. First, it was six weeks long initially. And we became, after that, interestingly enough, good friends. And we wrote each other back when they didn't have texting and emailing and all that. We wrote each other for years. And we talked about what had just happened. And I said, you know, I feel bad for punching your lights out. That's what I told him. He said, I feel bad because you punched my lights out. <laughs> but we talked about how what had just happened. What took place? And we talked about other times when people had gotten in trouble and things and apologized, repented. But they talked about, we talked about, you know what, we really didn't set a good example and we let all these people down. And I have a question. It's when people let you down, what do you do? Now, you may think, well, I would have never let that fly at my camp. They would have been sent home immediately because we have to have complete submission and control and everybody's just happy and always gets along even though they hate each other in their hearts. But we can't show it outwardly, of course. So we just smile and love everybody and diss them behind their back. <coughs> this is where what we just read that Christ taught, that we have to forgive others. That's what they did to us. And we, this young man and myself, had to forgive each other. It's where the concept of the art of mercy and forgiveness came into mind. In the case of these particular people, based on the attitudes of what they saw, they looked at both of us and said, you know what, we're going to give them another chance. And the subsequent summers, we were both given a job again at camp with more responsibility. I went back many times. But I do remember this. I remember my counselor talking to me. And he told me, and he told my friend as well, that over his years and later as a camp director, sometimes he had to send some people home. And he just did. They had to go home. Sometimes he said, and you're not allowed to come back. You can apply all you want, but you'll never be accepted. Did that mean that he did not forgive? I don't think so. Because a large part of mercy and forgiveness is not just forgiving someone, but also what do you do after? How do you treat the person? What do you say? Or what don't you say? I've had people tell me, well, you like to talk a lot, and sometimes you don't say anything. Well, a lot of times I don't say anything because I realize it's not going to produce anything good, so I just don't say anything. 
You know, why don't you want to talk about this? Because they don't want to talk about it. I'm not interested. It's not going to create anything good. And so I don't. And a large part of art and mercy is what do you do? The story from camp resonates strongly because I lived the situation. But to dig deeper into the concept, I want to turn to scripture for more better insight. And there are similar stories in the Bible. I, I had so many, and I've thought about this for a while, there were so many examples we could go days talking about it. But these stories in God's word can help us to learn the art of mercy and forgiveness. You've heard of people that, yeah, they cook a good meal, and then, oh, they, they know the fine art of cooking, or painting, or sewing, or doing the webcast. There's those that just do it, and those that have learned the art of webcasting, the refinement. The first thing we have to remember as Christ lives in us, as we attempt to have that happen, is that we must forgive because... God forgives. That's real simple. We say it. But before I consider some stories we're going to go through today, let's consider some basic instruction in scriptures telling us what we do have to do to forgive others. In Luke chapter 17, Luke chapter 17, and verse 3, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother trespasses against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. All right, so if you rebuke your brother, he's got to apologize and repent, and then you forgive him. Right? In a perfect world. If he trespasses against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day he turns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Now, we're starting to push the envelope here. And the apostles said, Lord, increase our faith. Okay? It requires a lot of faith to forgive others, doesn't it? It requires a lot of faith to forgive others. And we know, as the story goes on, so it says seven times... Let me ask you a question. Have you ever had somebody really, really offend you or do something? And you say, okay, I can overlook that. And then the second time, and then the third time, and then the fourth time, right? And you're like, okay, that's enough. I'm done with this. But we know the story, and we're going to talk about it. There's a principle. There's a lesson. Ask yourselves, how many, time has God, God, how many times has God forgiven you? Well, just once. And I gave my heart to the Lord, got baptized, and we're all done. Hardly. And so, Luke chapter 17, it's automatic. If and when someone repents, which seems to equate to apologizing, you just forgive. And Jesus started the instruction with this whole story, take heed to yourselves. Let me translate that. I'm talking to you, okay? Not telling you how to deal with your brother or your family member or your spouse or pick whoever. He said, take heed to yourselves. This is about the person who has been wronged. It's not about the sinner. It, isn't say, it is saying that if you don't forgive, you're in big trouble. And that's not going to be easy. That's why the disciples asked for more faith, because we can't do this by our own power. That's one of the biggest problems that we as human beings have. We think, yeah, we can deal with this. We know how to do it. Why, we're such a forgiving, nice person. No, you're not a forgiving, nice person. You may think you are, but we're really not without God living in us. And we need God dwelling into, in us by his Holy Spirit. And I may remind you, even with that, it's still not easy. The forgiving may be for our own sakes more than for the repentant sinner. Let's turn to Matthew to add more. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. 
one of the most misused scriptures in the Bible, this whole passage. Let's begin at verse 21, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 21. Then came Peter to Jesus Christ and said, Lord, how many, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. So he knew that easy enough. And Jesus said what? I'm going to paraphrase. Not seven, but 70 times seven. So do you think he had a pen and paper? Like, you know, Harry's always got in his pocket, usually a pencil. He's got, he's got to have a pencil, a little piece of paper in there to write stuff down. And so does he write down, okay, that's 70, that, the seven, that's seven times two times three. You're going to be writing a long time. Okay? And so he said, okay, because this is a requirement, it's not a suggestion. Okay? It's a requirement. There's a parable. The kingdom of God is like a king settling accounts. The servant we know owned 10,000 ta 10, talents, and he begged for more time to pay, and the king freely gave, forgave the debt. Then the servant found another and owed him 100 denarii. The servant begged for more time to pay, but he wouldn't allow it. He put him in prison. This upset the master so much, he delivered the servant to the torturers. And you get down to verse 35. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do unto you, if you are from your hearts, do not forgive everyone his brother that trespasses. So what will your heavenly Father do to you if you don't from the heart forgive your brother? Well, he'll forgive me anyway. Are you sure about that? Because there's many examples. The parable seems to tell us to see things in perspective. No one has sinned against any of us nearly as much as we have sinned against God. And we know in Romans chapter 2, verse 1, it says, You are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judges another, wherein you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you yourself do the same thing. Now, it's not saying we shouldn't judge. We don't condemn eternally because we don't know the outcome. And we need to make judgments. But when you start to notice all the things everybody else does, right? I don't want to make anybody embarrassed, but I can tell you this. When you travel to visit someone, and we're here for a week, and they've been at our house. When you go to someone's house, I don't care where it is, there's an old saying, and I'm not saying this has happened, but there's an old saying, fish and visitors are like the same thing after three days. They both stink. Now, what does that mean? That means that... When people come, and we have people do this, they come to visit, we love to have them, but they have their way of doing things, you have your way, and if you're not careful, you'll get into this, why don't you do things the way I do? Right? Hence we have a saying, we try to do it, blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be bent out of shape. Okay? It could be what time you get up, what you eat, when you eat, what you do, you know, and so what we find, and this is what happens, and this is what's big in the world. Americans, as a general, are very poorly educated in this. If the whole world was like us, everybody would be fine. That's why we're having all the problems we do with the United States. We have all these people from other countries living here now. Why doesn't everybody just do it like we do? Why don't the Southerners do it like the Northerners? Right? Why don't they get their stuff together and be on time? That's a big thing for the South and the North. It's kind of a generality. right? Why can't people save money? Why do they eat too much? Why do they eat too little? right? And you go through the list. Well, we then get into that, into the fellowships in the body of Christ. If everybody did it this way, and I was in charge, then everybody would be happy. And God says, that's funny. Right? That's funny. I'll tell you, there's one job, if God had called me, and I praise him, I wasn't alive then, one job I would have never wanted in my life, and that's to be Moses. Ever. Can you imagine dealing with several million people that are just like we are? Because you had some that say, we don't want to move. He'd say, well, yeah, but the cloud's moving. You've got to go. We don't want to move. We're sleeping in. You'd have others like, come on, God, let's go. It's 5 a.m., right? 
We don't like that food. We want this. We want that. There's too much. The, the tent, when I, it blocks us. The, the cloud blocks the sun. I'm not getting a good sun tan like I want. Or it's too hot. Right? At night, I can't sleep. There's too much light. Others like, there's not enough light. And you get into the whole thing. And so, if we're not careful, we could become guilty. And what will happen is, people will let you down. Because they don't arrive at where you would like them to be. One of the blessings and challenges of serving congregations all over the United States and world is the huge difference. And I just laugh at it. It's funny. How each congregation, I, I can remember when I lived in Wisconsin, it was humorous because you had some very strong-willed, opinionated leadership that each one had their own opinion how everything should be done. And it was just funny. And then you go to the South, that's where I've served, and they're like, they don't care as long as you have, it's done. They don't care. Chairs don't have to match. Well, yes, they do have to match, right? And everything has to be ready to go at 10.30. Not 10.31, but 10.30. And then in Colombia, the country, and in Guatemala and other areas, we learned that I just stopped wearing my watch because looking at it only, they would look at you like, what are you doing that for? And so what happens is people will let you down. All of us have let down God. What was his reaction? He could be and would be justified in just obliterating all of us, just poof, like a crispy critter. But instead he gave his only begotten son as a sacrifice so that the very people who let him down could have another chance, a big chance. And the more we retain that perspective, the better we should be able to forgive others. When we forgive, we are exercising a godly trait, and that alone is a good reason. Okay, how do we do it? We've actually covered two important parts of forgiving. First, we draw the mind of Jesus Christ that is in us through the Holy Spirit. We pray and ask God sincerely to help us to forgive. How many of us often say, I'm really sorry. Would you forgive me? Or I don't have to. I don't have to. I don't care if they forgive me or not. This is how it is. That's why so many marriages have challenges, because they haven't learned to forgive and what's really important. The second thing, think of your own sin. Think of how much you want and need your Heavenly Father to forgive you. That should help you show mercy. Right? That should help you show mercy. And let me add a third principle, if you will. We cannot get better at anything if we don't practice. Some people like to just roll off a log, as they say, and be able to do it perfectly. They don't want to practice. Do you remember what Thomas Edison said? Someone said, over 900 times you failed in making a light bulb. He said, no, I just figured out 900 ways that don't work. You got to keep practicing. You have to have prototypes. You have to, to see what works and you have to applicate and use. Now, it means starting with small things. Again, none of these are reflective of being here. I just This is part of my notes. I wrote this way before I came here. Too many times we try to bite off way more than we can chew. And some people think I can handle it. So I'm just going to take big, huge bites. Yesterday we had steaks for dinner and it was really big steak, and it took me a long time, but I just cut off one piece. I'm not one of these that cuts it all into pieces and lays it out, okay? But you cut a piece off, and then I'd eat it, chew on it, and I'd say, man, I haven't even made a dent in the thing. But if I would have tried to shove that whole thing down my mouth, I would have been in trouble. And some of us try to do that when it comes to practicing things. And so here's some examples. Forgive the person who took the last cold drink out of the fridge. All right? Forgive the person. I'm going to share this. This is funny. This is not applicable to here, but this is funny. When I grew up, my dad, we were very poor, and every penny counted. He had to count every penny. 
we were always told, turn the lights out. Now you may think, okay, you turn the lights out. But when we visit some places, they have every light in the house on. If they leave it on all the time, right, Gail? The lights are on. That's their house. That's fine. But I have ingrained in me, I turn the lights off. And you could go, and there's nobody been in that room for five hours, and all the lights are on. And I'm thinking in my head, I'm helping them not spend money. Well, and, and you end up, you say, well, that's such a small thing. I remember one time staying with someone, and they said, whatever you want in the fridge is yours. Just help yourself. So I saw something in there. I said, okay. So I took it and drank it. And the person came up and said, you drank my last drink. I said, I did. You said I could have anything there. Yeah, not that. <laughs> now I got to go get another one. I felt really bad. I said, well, I, I'll, I'll go buy one. No. I'm like, okay. So we talked about that. I said, I'm really sorry. I won't do that again. I said, and I, after that, he's like, well, just help yourself. I'm like, I ain't touching anything. I don't want to take something that's your last thing. I don't know what else there might be. He said, you're too sensitive. I said, no, you just chewed me out for taking your last drink. I don't know what could be your last of whatever else. How about forgiving the person who drives too fast on the street, endangering people? That's kind of an interesting topic where I live back home because it's mostly older people in the uh, subdivision and some of the younger people moving in now, buying homes, uh, seem to not see the speed limit sign or the people walking and it's become problematic. Once you begin to forgive on these little tiny things and it gets bigger, it becomes part of your nature to forgive on bigger things. By the way, there's another issue that I haven't addressed and I think it's an important one. We need to talk about it. What if the person doesn't apologize, isn't sorry, and doesn't repent? What if they're not one bit sorry? Anybody ever run into somebody like that? You know, I remember as a child being said, now you tell your sister you're sorry. I'm like, I ain't going to do it. You need to tell her you're sorry for doing that. Nope, I ain't going to do it. It wasn't going to happen. Thankfully, as adults, we don't have that mindset. Pardon my sarcasm. Jesus t didn't tell the disciples they have to forgive a brother seven times in a day, and if he comes and says, I'm not repenting, I'm not sorry, he doesn't talk about that. What we read in Matthew 6.15 did not say anything about repentance. Now, wait a minute. I'm not about to forgive someone if they're not going to apologize or they're not going to repent. I'm not going to forgive them. God says, oh, really? Christ simply said, if you don't forgive men their trespasses, your Father won't forgive your trespasses. Does that imply that whoever sins against you repents? It might be possible to make the argument. I'm not going to make it. But I firmly see from Scripture where we need to base our beliefs that although it's hard to do, we have to forgive someone even when he or she is not repentant. And when you do, it's good for you and it's good for me. Now, I think it would be a safe surmising that all of us can think of someone who has done us wrong and has never apologized. And they may never apologize. Maybe someone who bullied you in school. Anybody ever been bullied in school? I was. Maybe an old boyfriend or girlfriend who treated you badly. Well, I'm way past that. I've been married, you know, 40, almost 40 years. Oh, I remember. Uh, I remember some boys and girls that I went to school with that really treated me badly, and I treated some others badly. Maybe a coworker or an employer who lied about you or took advantage of you. There's so many more possibilities unique to each one of our lives. But I'm sad to say that I can put myself on the wrong side of some of these situations as much as I can recall having been sinned against. And therein lies what's really important to examine our heart and say, okay, before I start getting all nitpicky about all these other things people have done to me, what about what you've done to other people? You may say, well, I've never done that. Oh, you have. And if you think you haven't, I guarantee you have. We can all say that. Um, 
I know as a teenager and as an adult, and still, sometimes I'm unkind to, to people. Some of the girls I dated, I have been sincerely repentant, but I never had an opportunity to express it to them. Uh, you may say, well, I have never treated someone like that. Oh, you'd be surprised. You probably have. I know that it makes a difference. I've talked to God about those things. I've repented to him. But repenting to God is what really matters in the long run, but there needs to be both. All have sinned against God, a violation of his law, a disruption of the order in his universe when you violate his law. Do you realize that? Consider something King David wrote in Psalm 51. This psalm describes his deep, heartfelt repentance after committing adultery with Bathsheba and essentially murdering her husband Uriah. In verse 3 and 4, he said, I acknowledge my transgressions of Psalm 51, and my sin is always before me against you, and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Now, wait a minute. I read that, and I first noticed it. I stopped. I thought, wait a minute. This is not an easy concept to grasp. He is sinning against God, and you can do this with people. You say, okay, they're sinning against God, not me. And when you sin, you can say, I'm sinning against God, not necessarily that other person. God's nature determines what is and isn't sin, not us. And so all too often, we determine what is sin and what isn't. That's why you have so many religious groups all over the map, because they want to determine what sin is based on what they think it is, their interpretation, instead of what God says it is. God's nature determines what is and isn't sin. So doing anything that is contrary to God's nature, which Harry talked about, which is love, is a sin against him, period. And additionally, all of us belong to God, as did Uriah and Bathsheba. When David hurt them, he was hurting what belonged to God. God gave Uriah life in the first place, and he had the right to take it away at any time. But would you have said that was the way he should have his life taken away? And God will give it again when it suits him. He could have prevented David from hurting Uriah. Do you realize that? Or he could have resurrected him immediately. And if God had done that, David still would have been guilty. And David needed to repent. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, a verse as we call it, many call it that, verse 23 and 28, Jesus said that being angry with your brother or having him Hating him in your heart is as bad as murder. All right? I've heard some comments about our current president, which I don't care for. But I'm not involved in the political process. But some of the things that have been said, I'm like, oh, wow, you're treading on fine, a fine line there. Lusting for a woman is the same to God as committing adultery. So you said, well, I never slept with that person or that man. Well, what did you think about? And I don't want to minimize how much bad actions can really hurt us because even as we know our thoughts create the really bad things. But it's always better to stop, even if only in your mind you really want to do the act. I know a man one time said, well, you know, uh, I just can't. I can't agree with having to pay this amount of tax on what I made. I'm like, so what do you plan to do? He said, I'm not going to pay it. I said, why? He said, because they, they don't need it. It's not fair. I said, but it's the law. He said, I don't care what the law is. It's not right. I'm not going to pay it. So the person didn't, didn't pay it for a few years. He ended up in prison. It's still there. So when you begin to go through this process, we consider and we make the case that sin is against God. Everyone's going to have to answer to him sooner or later. They're not going to have to answer to you. They're going to have to answer to God, as will you. And it is God who grants the ultimate forgiveness, the one that matters the most. In the future, people will come up in the resurrection whom I have wronged, 
And I never got to apologize or express repentance to them. And they'll learn that God has already forgiven me a long time ago. So, would they be able to do, do they have another option? How would they do differently? Now, if I turn that around, I think of the people who have wronged me, even if we want to say they sinned against me, ultimately, no matter how I may feel about that person, whether I've forgiven him or her or not, he or she will have to repent and be forgiven by God, not by me. And some people live their lives saying, until that person apologizes to me and repents to me, they won't be forgiven. I think there's going to be some people say, well, how did they get in the kingdom of God? Well, they repented. Yeah, but they never apologized to me, so what? That's how some think. Now, if the person doesn't repent, they'll have the fate of other non-repentant people, the lake of fire, eternal death. And of course, a person's ultimate fate, eternal life or eternal death, does not all depend upon my forgiveness or yours or your forgiveness, but on God's forgiveness. So with all that, it makes sense that I need, talking to me, to forgive people who wrong me and wrong me even if they're not yet repentant. Even if they don't repent or apologize. I won't hurt them or punish them anymore by not forgiving them than if I do. But I can hurt myself. And that's the greater thing that we consider. How much stress, how much mental and emotional pain will I save myself if I just, as we say, let go of the wrongs done to me. How about you? Some of you may say, oh, I'm over that. I'm so over that. Well, sometimes just in talking you find out, no, you're really not over that. And I'm not over that. In my mind, I need to forgive and know that it's in God's hands where it has to end up eventually. How many of you have said, how many of us have said, we'll just leave it in God's hands? And what that means, we'll leave it in his hands as long as his hands do it the way we want his hands to do it. And he says, well, that's not what I was thinking, Scott, or whatever your name is. It sounds like a lot, all of this. There's plenty to think about. But as we begin to practice the art of mercy and forgiveness, keeping in mind God's forgiveness, both his mercy toward you and me, and his judgment and mercy toward those who may hurt or wrong us. It's looked at very differently than we look at it. There's another practical matter to consider in all this. Forgiveness is one thing. But how to have personal interaction afterwards may be something quite different. And I want to talk about this. Because this comes up, I... I take calls from people. I talk about this I've, for a very long time. How do you relate to a forgiven person? If you think back to the stories I told and we began this message, there's something that we should consider. When my friend let me down by letting go of the pole that held the kite, the string, twice, three times, I forgave him but I decided I needed to wait a long time before I let him hold the pole again. Does that mean that I didn't forgive him? I knew that in the future someday he'd be able to fly a kite just fine, but I didn't choose to not let him hold the string because I was mad or wanted to punish him. I realized that his level of focus, responsibility, wasn't completely ready for the task yet. And when the SCP staff, the staff at SCP, that youth camp, gave me another chance, they followed up by telling both me and the other young man there were other piece, people they had sent people home from camp for doing something like this. And sometimes they didn't let them come back. So it's a given that people will let you down, they'll hurt you, and aside from forgiving them, you have to decide if and when to give them another chance. Now it's getting sticky, isn't it? How do you decide that? It's not easy, and I'm not sure of a certain exact answer. You remember the old saying, 
You fool me once, shame on you. You fool me twice, shame on me. It's like the neighbor's dog. We have a dog next door that I don't pet. I don't give him treats. Because he's an abused dog, uh, a rescue. He's very finicky and very weird. And he's all lovey-dovey and friendly, tail wagging, smiling, until you reach in with the treat in the cage, and he takes the treat, and then he tries to bite you. And if you bend down as he's walking up with his master to pet him, he'll go, the bristle of the neck. I'm like, I ain't touching that dog. Oh, he won't hurt you at all. He just does that. Well, you know, okay? So if I reach in to give him a treat and he bites me, whose fault is that? That's the way we think. I think a large part of the art of mercy and forgiveness is judging how much interaction you should have with people who have wronged you or hurt you and in what way you'll have the interaction. You may say, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Sometimes you need to keep distance between you and the person you forgive. What? Yes. Do you remember what the Apostle Paul said? He said, live peaceably with all men, which means men or women, if at all possible. What's that mean? Why would he write that? And so, perhaps to help both of you overcome some other problems, because there's no longer a good reason for you to spend time together. I, Gil, and I've learned this. Many of the people that were really, fr I mean, I think of our wedding. The, the people that were in my wedding. I don't think I've talked to all of them for a very long time, for decades. Does it mean they're not my friend anymore? I just, we've gone different directions. Some of them have things that they feel very strongly about that we don't, and it's better to not get together and discuss that. And so Paul says, live peaceably with all men if at all possible. That means sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it isn't. Again, it's more of an art than a science, to be exact. You won't find clear-cut procedures in the Bible for this, but we can find stories that illustrate different approaches and try to learn from other people's successes and failures. Do you think that every story of people in the Bible, they all learned how to get together and play nice and everything was fine? There's not one. Oh, sure there is. No, there isn't. There isn't. It's quite fascinating. And if you turn to 2 Samuel 13, I'm going to summarize the story. Amnon, king of David's firstborn son, is being lovesick over his sister Tamar. Do I need to explain what lovesick means? I won't, I won't because I get accused of explaining things in too much detail. He schemed a way to be alone with her and ended up raping her. There, I just answered it. Then he decided that he did not love her and he sent her away humiliated. Tamar had a brother named Absalom who was not the forgiving type. In 2 Samuel, and you can read it, chapters 12 to 20, I'll give you the synopsis. 2 Samuel 13, verses 12 to 20, Absalom, her brother, said, Has Abdon, your brother, been with you? Has he slept with you? Hold your peace, he's your brother. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother's house. When King David heard of it, he was very angry. Who wouldn't be? And Absalom spoke to his brother Amnon, neither good or bad, for Absalom hated Amnon in his heart because he had forced his sister Tamar against her consent. It seems there's a whole bunch of things if you read the story, and I'd recommend you go read it later, 2 Samuel 13, 12 to 20. There's a lot of things that weren't handled well. David was angry, but apparently, even though he was angry, he didn't punish Amnon. And did David forgive him? Remember, Tamar was David's daughter. So, if so, something good, but the action afterward may not have been so good. We see that Absalom and probably Tamar did not forgive, but also did not express how he felt. Instead, he schemed for revenge. Do you know some of us do that? We scheme for revenge? Oh, you don't do that. Of course you don't. Neither do I. Yes, you do. You think of ways that you could, okay, we're going to get it so they do it this way. 
because they should have done. They should have learned their lesson, right? Not a good example for us to follow. Romans chapter twelve, verse nine says that vengeance is God; He'll repay. It's not for us to do. People say, "I'd sue them, so and so's, take them to court, right? Do this, do that, teach them a lesson." Kick them out of the church. All right? That's a lot of guys are really good at that. A lot of groups are. Just kick them out of the church. You know, so they can't fellowship with anyone and they're out there separate and miserable and hurting and right? Well we have to do that to protect the body. Okay. Maybe we should kick you out and leave the people in. Absalom waited until perhaps most people thought the incident was past and forgotten. It was all done. And two years later invited Abnon, along with all the king's sons, to a feast and celebration of successful sheep shearing. It looked like Absalom had forgiven, was willing to have a brother relationship with Abnon. Okay? But, in 2 Samuel chapter 13, let's go back there. 2 Samuel chapter 13. Verse 28. But Absalom commanded his servants, saying, Mark you now, when Abnon's heart is merry with wine, when I say unto you, smite Abnon, then kill him. Don't fear. Have not I commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. And the servants of Absalom did unto Abnon as Absalom commanded. Then all the king's son arose, and every man got up upon his mule, and they fled. So he said, Wait till he's drunk. He's having a great time. And then kill him. So Absalom's servant, Abs <coughs> Absalom's servants did as they were commanded. Well, you do, of course. And later, in verse 32 of, of, of thir chapter 13, Absalom had determined this from the day Amnon raped Tamar. He had waited all this time for the opportunity to take care of this problem. Now, we can only wonder what might have been. How different would several people's lives see been if David had taken charge and punished Amnon? Or if Absalom had sought legal punishment? Actually, the death penalty may have been imposed, but not by deceit. Not to mention how different things may have been if Amnon had been repentant. We don't know for certain that he wasn't, but it doesn't look that way. So, we don't need to wonder about what could have happened. Let's consider what did happen next. 2 Samuel 13, verse 37 to 39. So Absalom fled, and he went to Talmai, son of Abihud, and David mourned for his son every day. Absalom fled. He, he was away for about three years, and King David longed to go to Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Amnon. Appears to be what I could gather, a case of David being able to forgive one son for killing another, which was probably easier to do considering Absalom was a close enough relative to Tamar to have enforced a death penalty. I don't know for sure if this is how David perceived it or not, but I can see from reading it a real problem if how he chose to interact or not to with Absalom. Have you ever thought about this? Being able to forgive is good, but it seems that he never let Absalom know. Maybe he couldn't. He wouldn't go see him even though he wanted to. That's an important point, I think. David misses Absalom, wants to spend time with him, but he won't, and it seems that Absalom was left ignorant of everything. A lot of times when we read stories in the Bible, we don't look at him for what's really being said. We look at him for what we want him to say. We already read that Absalom said nothing to Amnon, leaving bad feelings to fester, and probably Amnon thought nothing was wrong, when certainly there was. I wonder if David had sent a message to Absalom saying, I forgive you and I love you, but for the time being I need to not see you while I get things sorted out in my mind. But I will, and then we can have a relationship. Perhaps even if he said, I want to have a relationship with you, but for political reasons and potential harm to the country, I can't come see you right now. And we could sit back from a distance and say, it would be so easy to fix this situation. 
Here's all you need to do. Well, that's from our lens. But when we're in it, it's much different. And within the body of Christ, there are lots and lots of examples, I won't give any of them, of stories of people and churches that I know, families, where somebody has all the answers, but those aren't the answers because they're not in it. They may think they are, they may project the ways, but they don't know. There's currently one going on in Facebook. Okay, it's becoming quite elevated. Both sides. And it's kind of sad because it's very sad because what it does is it makes people say, I know one thing, I don't want nothing to do with any of that, any of those groups. And so, Joab, the commander of the army, knew that David wanted to see Absalom. And in the 14th chapter of 2 Samuel, we read a strange story of Joab employing a woman to present a case to David, convincing him to allow Absalom to return from exile. In 2 Samuel 14 and verse 21, the king said to Joab, all right, bring back Absalom. In verse 24, the king said, let him return to his own house, but do not let him see my face. So he did so. And rather than wonder how this made Absalom feel, we can read it in his own words, sent through Joab two days later. In 2 Samuel 14, verse 32 to 33, Absalom said to Joab to send to the king, saying, Why have I come from Geshur? I would have been better for me to, not, to, for me to be there still. Therefore, let me see the king's face. If there is iniquity in me, let him execute me. So Joab went to the king and told him, and he called for Absalom. And he came before the king, and he bowed, and the king kissed Absalom. Doesn't seem to be a particularly warm reunion. As I said before, and I can't say exactly what David should have done, but what Absalom said makes some sense. He said, if I deserve to die, then kill me. If not, let's meet and talk. When did Absalom scheme to commit treason to kill his father and seize the throne? We don't know. Would things have been completely different if David had talked to Absalom? We could say, well, of course. We don't know. I think it would have been better. In this extended story, unfortunately, we can find a lot more bad examples than good. And these examples include a couple of special circumstances that you and I need to note. One does not apply to us, not in this current age. That is that David was king. He was responsible for the government, for law enforcement, as well as his own feelings and relationships. The other circumstances, special ones, will apply to us in many cases. That is, a sin and a need to forgive someone who is family. When a family, and this is not talking about me, okay? It's all of us. When a family member offends you or sins against you, it hurts more than someone else does. And when I say family, I'm talking in a spiritual sense as the body of Christ, when someone in the church, the body of Christ, offends you or sins against you, it hurts more than what someone else does. And it's a lot harder to forgive. And therein lies the major challenge we still face. I've been involved with the body, the church of God, for over 60 years. As long as I can remember, we've had the same problem with this then when I started, as we do today. Now, when I say family, it can mean physical, spiritually, the body of Christ, the church, fill in the blank. The old saying, you only hurt the ones you love, should say, you can only hurt the ones who love you. If an acquaintance or a co-worker does us wrong, we'd be able to just brush it off and keep going. If they're sorry, it's not so hard to forgive. But when someone I love does me wrong, or was a good friend, it feels more like a personal betrayal, and it may well have been one. And we think, how could you do that? Well, maybe some say to us, how could you do that? 
Oh, they've never said that about me. Oh, sure they have. Sure they have. Our feelings are hurt. We hesitate to forgive even when the offending party may be really sorry. Hence going back to the beginning of the message. Oh, I forgive. I'll just never forget. And if you look back at your life growing up as a child, a teenager, you know, unfortunately this comes up. People that have been married for decades still have things that hurt. And they've never been resolved. They've just been buried. But they're still there. Sometimes a person may be begging for forgiveness. We're like, nope, we ain't going to do it. And the offending person may not express his or her repentance even when he or she feels it because he thinks his family member should already know. Well, of course they should know I feel like this. This happens all the time in the church. Of course they should know I'm, I'm feeling like this. Maybe they're clueless. Maybe they don't. The art of mercy and forgiveness may be especially difficult to practice, and I know it is, within physical families, within the church, the body of Christ. It's very difficult. I think a lesson we can learn from David and Absalom is that when we're in such a tough situation, it's better to talk and communicate, but sometimes it doesn't happen. And part of forgiveness is to say, that's okay. You may have others say, well, you need to just go, talk about this and sort it out. Everything could be fine. That's why we do it. Well, each one of us, if we're open, ask yourself, have you always been that way? Again, you may think you have, but you may not. Constantly I hear this. You just need to go talk to this minister, this church, this pastor, these people, and everything will be fine. I'm like, don't do that because it's only going to exacerbate it and make it worse. Well, how do you know? because you live through it. The other thing is don't keep it all in. Some of us do that. It may hurt at the time, but it's better to tell someone, I'm hurt, I'm angry. But it's sometimes it makes it worse. It's easier to forgive and salvage something from a relationship when both sides know what the other's thinking. And that is a wonderful explanation of what happens with all of us. And you know, we kind of laugh about it. But it's like this morning, we were standing in the kitchen. I made the comment. I said, yeah, it was how to do something. I said, well, I guess I, sh I could read the instructions. I'd know how to do it, right? But then I said, well, men don't usually read instructions. Said, Why ain't it working? My wife will say, or the women will say, because they usually are better at that. Just read the instructions. And so many times, you learn, you should learn, and you salvage the relationship when you find out what the other person is thinking or feeling. But we have to forgive. We don't have to maintain close association with someone we forgive all the time. But I know it's tough, but we need to forgive. And frankly, speaking openly, there's a huge number of folks that have not forgiven. They haven't. And we all struggle. We work through it. So is all this worth that much consideration? Do we need to talk about it so much? Well, probably we do because people will let us down. They will hurt us. We will hurt others. And we're all people. At one time or another, we're going to let someone down. People will hurt us badly. They'll betray us. We are God's children. His people, we know about repentance. And God's way is what? Of mercy and forgiveness. And we have to forgive others. As we become more like God, we should be desiring to forgive others. But knowing that we have to do it and how to do it are not the same. So showing mercy and forgiveness is an art. It is. Learning that art requires perspective and seeing ourselves more as God sees us. It requires God's spirit in us to do it really well. And here's the interesting part. We'll get better with practice and time as we yield our will to God. And of course, once we forgive someone, we, we have to consciously choose how we or will not interact with them in the future. And again, in all of this, it seems open communication is important. So, folks, brethren, 
we need to talk. Talk to God and talk to each other. And remove the lens of how our perspective taints everything and ask God, how do you see things? How do you look at things? It's quite eye-opening, actually. And as we go through that process, we'll grow in proficiency with the art of mercy and forgiveness.